Hey, hey, everybody. Oh, hey, we're already mic'd. I was <laughs> waiting to pick up a mic. Hi. Hi, right, it's good to be here. I, thank you. I, right at the beginning, I'm just going to admit up front, I'm, we're not blowing anything up today. I'm sorry. <laughs> not setting anything on fire. <laughs> cool. This is my emotional support image. It's just a glimpse of my shop back in San Francisco. Um, the, uh, the three containers with metal drawers, you can see those are actually airplane food containers, food, food uh, carriages. You can buy them on eBay for about 300 bucks a piece. The drawers are colossally shitty. Um, but I line them and then I line them with foam core dividers and that middle ladder of all the, uh, of all the uh, pliers and everything, um, I got rid of a six foot tall stack of tool boxes by building that. Yeah. So it's named, can I curse? I, I, I don't think okay. so. The name of that is <laughs> fuck drawers. <laughs> because drawers are where things go to die. <laughs> and I actually found at least two very important items to me while emptying out those drawers to build that thing. And the principle is like everything in sight and everything in reach. Is that it, the two? It, yeah. Yes. The shop philosophy for me is everything I want at my grasp without having to move anything out of the way. And so I call it first order retrievability. <laughs> I love it. So we're here at ReMars. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on Mars and ReMars and why this is interesting to you. And oh. <laughs> um, it's interesting to me because I love the conversations. I mean, I, I love the presentations, and I love seeing the tech that people bring. But most of all, I love it when you get a bunch of excited, passionate, smart people in a room, and you start to hear real information mm -hmm. being traded. And um, being a, a veteran of the Mars conference in, in Palm Springs, uh, I noticed the last time I was there, at the end of the night, on the last night, I'm listening to everyone around the campfire talking, but it doesn't sound like a normal party. Uh, everyone's having a good time, uh -huh. but some of the normal things you hear at a party, which is like, that one guy who laughs too loud, and someone <laughs> over here is mansplaining, and someone uh -huh. over there is pontificating. You don't... I didn't hear any of that. What I heard was people going, oh, and then there's a... Curiosity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exchanging of information. And mm. it, it, feels like, it feels like a key part of the ethos of the whole thing is just putting people in a room together and seeing what sparks might fly. Yeah. And I, I, that's what could be better. So I thought it was all about AI, but it turns out to be about a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, it's got robotics and everything. So one of the things that comes up a lot at this is this aspirational view of like, ooh, what would Iron Man be like? And how does Iron Man go? So I'd love to get your take and your experience uh, Iron Manning. So uh, <laughs> this is a lovely softball question uh, because I have a show uh, coming out on Discovery Channel a week from Friday called Savage Builds. Uh, it's my first, uh, well, I did Mythbusters Jr. last summer, which aired earlier this year. I don't know if it's going to get picked up again, uh, but this is the first time I've hosted a show on my own. And uh, it is an absurd engineering show in which we build different weird things every week with different collaborators. Mm. Everyone from Tori Belici from Mythbusters came on one episode. Uh, Gary Oldman shows up in another app. Uh, Adam Steltzner, one of the engineer scientists from JPL, helped me on a third. And the, Chicago, the Colorado School of Mines assisted me for the very first episode. Mm. We made a working, yeah, it, we made a working <laughs> prototype of Iron Man's armor. Yeah. <laughs> out of a quarter of a million dollars of 3D printed titanium. And my friend Richard Browning brought out his, rock, his jet suit called the Gravity Rig. Uh, and we shot bullets at it and we might or might not have gotten it to fly. So cool. It was, I mean, the thing is, I, when I started, I was just doing an appearance at the Colorado School of Mines last year and it was an amazing campus. Like I really liked the students, I liked the energy. Um, they had just built an entire building for additive manufacturing. This is an incredible school. And they said, we got a printer that prints three, prints titanium. Yeah. I said, cool. And they're like, you got anything you want to print? And I was like, how about a suit of armor? Of course. And EOS, the company that makes this printer, they donated the printing. Thank God. And we almost broke them. Yeah. Like 275 parts of, I mean, we were pushing the envelope of what they have achieved on those machines for the thinness and the refinement and everything. Um, Marvel cooperated fully, like we were using the original Iron Man Mark II suit computer files from Legacy Effects, which were ancient uh -huh. STL files from like 2007. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. They were hard to work so, with. What I love about this too is it's a blend of new and old. 
So you're 3D printing titanium. Yeah. You can't drill it. No, so. that, was the, that was the key part. We had to actually pop rivet it together. Well, so when I got to the school, they were using uh, JB Weld to put the suit together, which is fine. It, it would have been my first tr attempt. It just turns out that nothing sticks to titanium, like nothing. Uh, and Jamie Heineman, who used to have my old partner on Mythbusters, who used to have a charter boat business, said that actually titanium is the ideal boat material because lichen and sea life won't grow on it. Huh. But of course, it's kind of expensive. Right, right, right. So he only ever met bit. one guy who had a titanium boat. It was this crazy old Russian who'd like hammered and beat it out of old Russian decommissioned military equipment. Okay. So anyway, we're there with the, <laughs> with the JB weld, and I'm holding onto a bicep, and I grabbed something too hard, and it shattered and just broke into like the 11 pieces that made it up. I was like, oh, no. Right. I'm gonna, the whole I have to put this thing on in four days and, and wear it for a whole bunch <laughs> of stuff. And if it falls off me, I won't be able to hot glue it back. This is, this is mission critical. So I called my uh, lead builder back in my shop, John Marcou, and I was like, John, I want you to go get, I want you to go get the whole, go to the drawer labeled holes. <laughs> there's a drawer that just says holes. And in that drawer, there's an industrial steel hole punch, and it's actually a piece of computer history. This is one of the repair tools for one of the original Univac computers. And I bought it because it came from Ingersoll Rand, and it uh -huh. has the label on it, but I also use it because I consider it's the ethos to use a tool, it's a tool, not right. just put it up on a pedestal. So I said, take that hole punch, put a, a 530 seconds, uh, uh, a 930 seconds punch in it and see if you can punch through that one and a half mil titanium. And I hear him go shuffle, 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 da, da, da. And then I hear him, ding! <laughs> and he goes, yeah, it worked. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank God we have an episode. Because literally up until that moment, we would not have. I mean, I'm not sure what I would have done. I would have had to back everything in fiberglass, which would have been a nightmare. Yeah, right. So that's one of the things I like about this conference, because you're, you're hearing about AI and robotics and space and all these very future techs. And then and you, get to hear, you, you get to hear Ken Goldberg complain about picking up a washer. Right, right. right? It turns out that like, the, what defeats that's a robot? Adversarial. A washer. <laughs> Paper clips are hard. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or that poor duck, like it's like not suctionable. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so the... The other part about this is that that titanium was not just like milled out, it was 3D printed, well, centered. Th that like came up halfway through the episode is the, we were at the School of Mines and they have scanning electron microscopes and they were very excited to show me that when they scan the grain structure, you can attenuate a much finer internal uh, crystalline structure into the titanium. I don't know the specifics and I'm, I'm not even sure of the alloy of the powder they're using for the sintering process, but it's much stronger 3D printed than if you just milled it out of titanium or punched it out of sheets. Yes. Yes, so it is, it's totally bulletproof. We shot bullets at it. It's 45 right. caliber magnum rounds bounced right off of it. So I'm hoping folks here, as you see things in other talks and other things, they inspire you to like, how do you apply that weird space thing that you're seeing about a rover on Mars back to your business? And, like connecting those dots is super interesting. Well, that's, I love playing, I mean, I, I, I got to play around with the haptic arms. Yeah. And it feels like every now and then I, you, I get to play with a technology that feels exactly like my fantasy of what that technology should feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is definitely one of them. I was like, ooh, <laughs> rare. You know, I could get into trouble and I could see the guys on the other side like, ha, ha, ha you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And you picked up two cups at once. You're like, yes! Everybody's like, I got two cups. It's fabulous. It's <laughs> so good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your book, too. Okay. So uh, this is Everything is a Hammer. Every tool is a hammer. That's what I said. I said every tool <laughs> is a hammer. <laughs> um, and in that, there's a bunch of different uh, descriptions of how you think about creativity and how you think about your space in creativity and how you approach it. Um, one of the chapters you have is called Loose uh, Tolerances. And I found this super interesting in a couple veins. Uh, one was you talk a lot about fail fast and your thoughts on fail fast. And then I was, I'm coming from the Alexa team, I'm thinking about like customers using it. Right. Boy, you gotta handle tolerances. You gotta handle lots of things they might say and lots of variations. Well, it, it, so I come from the film industry, which yep. is um, there's never enough time and never enough people and you've just gotta get it done by the end of the day. Yep. Like no one cares why. Mm. You just have to get it done. And there's a particular mind uh, that works in the film industry and it's one that enjoys stupidly tight deadlines um, because 
I personally love tight deadlines because I love the ways in which they refine your decision trees. Mm -hmm. And specifically within special effects, like someone says, make this shiny gold. Well, that's, that's a sentence, and that means one thing in one case and another thing in another case. Yeah. So the, as a model maker, I would have to know, well, what's the big picture? Is this going to be in bright sunlight, which would change the kind of gold that I would use, or is it going to be used in a dark room? And being able to prioritize where your tolerance was. Is the camera close? Is it far? Uh, is it a key shot or is it a background shot? All of these things matter in terms of how much energy you put into the thing you're building. Mm. So I, I, I come from my industry, the film industry is, is, is one of knowing tolerance like that. What is ex the tolerance of acceptance? Um, and then within mechanical engineering, which I am also mediocre at, um, the idea of something being tight fitting or loose fitting. And Jamie and I learned really early on that if something was super tight fitting on Mythbusters, we had to bore it out and make it loose fitting because we were so abusive to everything we were using. Mm. So when we built our own crash test dummy, um, we built it with a ridiculous tolerance of like 10% on everything. But when it shattered into 20 pieces, we were able to put it back together in 10 minutes mm -hmm. because the bolts just slide right into these big old stupid holes. And then this other part happened was I was writing the book because I, I, it, it, the book sort of formed itself as I was writing. I, I, I didn't realize it would be so philosophical. I didn't realize I would go so much into creativity and my autobiography. I thought I'd be talking much more about glues and sandpapers and stuff, and I do. But I also found that, I, I, that the other parts were really important to me to discuss. Uh, and along those lines, I started noticing that there are these physics ideas that gridded beautifully onto my creative process. So one of them is momentum. Okay. And I get this question a lot. People ask about how do you keep momentum when you hit a snag in a project? And for me, on personal, on the clock, it's the clock. That, and that's, that's a specific thing. But like for me, when I'm running a project, it's my project or it's my clock. Yeah. Um, what helps me have momentum, there's a whole host of things, but the most primary one is obsession. Uh, is, is this something that I have to see to fruition? Mm. And if that's the case, I'll move heaven and earth to get to the end result. Even if I realize I've gone all the way down the wrong path and I have to scrap everything I've done and start from scratch, um, it is only doable if I'm obsessed with the end result that I want to achieve with that project. Um, so I thought the idea of momentum worked both from a physics perspective and an emotional perspective, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do lots of things to keep up my momentum. I use checklists, I make lots of lists, I color in boxes and checklists because it's very satisfying. In fact, I love coloring in check boxes so much, I add items like drive to work, eat a sandwich, <laughs> Just so and I put those so I more <laughs> colored black boxes at the other. Write a checklist. Yep. Ooh. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then the tolerance one was, it was a surprising grid between that emotional and uh, physics frame because uh, I, I realized that my ability as a model maker, what made me good at my job when I was doing that was that I could understand the big picture and know exactly how much tolerance I could apply to this or that project. Um, and that actually applying some tolerance to myself and my own mistakes mm -hmm. is also a key part of me as a maker because I don't hit any less snacks than anybody else. Mm. Um, the only difference is that I get to tell stories about those snags and make narrative meat out of them, mm -hmm. but it's no more fun for me than it is for anybody. I mean, right, right, right. it still sucks ass to hit something where I realized I got my order of operations wrong and I broke that tap in the part when the only thing that was left to do was to tap a hole. I've done that so many times. And I, I mean, not only do I do that, but when I hit those snags, my inner critic is super harsh. Yeah. My inner critic has said to me, I mean, on a monthly basis, my inner critic will say, you have no business making stuff and you should stop pretending that you know. So that's a really good example of being productive and quick and yet inventive and exploring. And through that whole thing, you didn't say, I fail really fast. Well, but it's so clearly you've... <laughs> you've been with me all day and we've I been know. talking about this. Yeah. The, the, I, I, I appreciate the idea of failure as a, as a, as a catchphrase. We, Silicon Valley loves the idea, fail fast and all of that. But I, I think it's time that we mature past the word failure because we don't really mean failure. Yeah. Sometimes, abject failure is like getting drunk and sleeping through your kid's birthday party. <laughs> right, like that is screwing up. Yeah. What we really mean is iteration. 
we mean that every project is going to require a ton of iterations. So my son wanted to make a Leatherman holster for his Leatherman that matched mine, and I was like, you're going to have to build it three or maybe four times. And he was like, 16. He's like, ugh. <laughs> And I'm like, it took me two try, three tries the first time I built one, and this one I'm wearing took me two tries. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an iterative process. And if we normalize those iterations, for kids specifically, um, I think we make it easier for them to understand that this is a normal part of the process. Um, the, and teaching to a test does not do that. Mm. I am not an educator, and I, like, I talk about education because it's important to me, but I really want to give the caveat, like, the idea of teaching children terrifies me. <laughs> and the people who do it, my hat is off to them. It is hard work. Um, but I do know that facts are not knowledge, and facts are generally the only thing that tests test for. Yeah, and you want to get the experiences under your belt, right? Yeah. Like, try things you got it. I mean, I went through... Um, over the 13 years I was making Mythbusters, actually, even going before that, I've learned every skill that I have on the job in general, the learn while you earn program. Yeah, yeah. And Mythbusters was no different. And I, I learned how to host a TV show, I learned how to produce a TV show, and I went through a bunch of different iterations during the making of it in which I was trying to figure out what my job was. And at first I was like, oh, my job is to build stuff. Oh, actually, my job is also to talk about building stuff. And then my job is to, then I had this epiphany of demonstrating that a penny has two different terminal velocities. I had to do this for an episode where will a penny thrown from the top of the Empire State Building kill you when it hits the ground? Right. And the answer is no, which is hilarious because if anyone ever believed it, every level of the Empire State Building below the observation deck is filled with change. Right, 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 right. right, right. Um, and so I ended up building a, a two-speed wind tunnel for showing that a penny, penny has two terminal velocities. So I was like, oh, I have something to contribute to this methodologically. I don't know what you mean and by then, two terminal. I'm so stuck on that. Well, you mean one where it's not flopping around and one well, where it's... Well, so um, most <laughs> things... So, okay, uh, uh, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so, I'm derailing. I have to know. <laughs> if, you, if you dropped my flashlight from an airplane, yes. it's, it, on average, its terminal velocity would end up being the mode in which it provides the most resistance to the wind. That, that, tend, that tends towards that. So it would probably fall like this on its side. If you shoot a bullet straight up, it comes down on its side like this. Okay. Um, and so most objects tend to fall stably in some orientation, but a penny is not. It's called a tumbling object. So it has a 65 mile per hour terminal velocity on its edge and a 25 mile per hour terminal velocity on its face. And we had this great bit of math from NASA, and I did a piece to camera about this in the first season. And then on the plane back, I realized that I had a point of view about this. Yeah. I was thinking about the piece to camera, and I was thinking something's sticking in me, and I was like, oh no, I have a point of view. The point of view is that I'd rather show than tell. And talking about math is the very definition of telling. So I thought, well, I just look up somebody who's built a penny wind tunnel. Someone must have done it. No. Right, 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 right. So I built my own. And I had this theory that if I build it right, when I put a penny in, the penny will tumble up and down. And when that penny tumbled up and down, understand, I have a high school diploma and a couple of package design classes from the School of Visual Arts. So for me, I always put science in the realm of things that smart people do. And I, by doing that, I put myself outside that category. So at this moment, when I put the penny in this wind tunnel and, th and, and <laughs> reality and theory matched, yeah. I have never been so thrilled. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, I've got something to contribute. And then, so cut to like three years after that, I was doing an interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I was watching him talk. And I was like, look at this guy. Yeah. This is a vat grown science communicator. This is his mission. He is proselytizing and evangelizing for science. That is such a cool, oh, that's actually my job too. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Right. And then I came all the way around to realizing that what I'm doing is telling stories. I mean, and it, it sounds almost, almost too obvious, but having, having played around deeply both as an artist and a scientist, I realized that science and art are simply two different ways of telling stories about how the world works. And one is arguably more rigorous and one is arguably more emotional, but they both drift deeply into each other's territory. Uh, and I can't remember what the hell your original question was. No, I got, I got my next question. Okay. So that's awesome. So we've got, um, we're talking about being creative and making use of stuff. And so we were talking about experiential experiences. 
One of the things you talk about in your book is the importance of sharing. So I think where you were headed is an interesting way to go there. But so instead of talking about your sharing, like why is it important for creative people to share? Like that's part of what we're here about, right? Is yeah. To cross pollinate. So uh, it's funny. We have a very we have a very uh, fame obsessed obsessed culture in America, and we have we definitely love the myth of the singular creator. Mm. I'm a I'm a victim of this. My father was the singular creator in my house. My mm -hmm. dad was a genius. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm still getting over that um, because I've met singular creators. I've been lucky enough to meet one or two of them, and they're amazing human beings, but they are, they are surpassingly rare. Yeah. The rest of us have to work together. Right. <laughs> uh, and as, I, as I've gone through my various careers, I've, I noticed at one point that I, was, I had worked for people who had been my assistant, and I had hired former bosses. Mm -hmm. And I realized this is all part of a continuum. There's no hierarchy, really. It's more temporal than anything else. And you know, I started off in the making of things as a very bad delegator, because I'm fast, which means I like to do things myself. And I don't like to watch someone else take more time. And I've had to really learn how to let stuff go and let other people take it and, and run with it. But I have gotten so much out of that relationship so much more out of that than I thought because yeah. when I work with great people and they have autonomy over the things that they're working with and they bring their stuff to my stuff what we make is way in excess of what was what I even possibly imagined was feasible when we started so I talk about sharing in the book I talk about sharing responsibility and sharing a project um, but I also talk about uh, sharing the credit that's really really vital um, sharing the enthusiasm, sharing the joy, sharing encouragement. Um, I, in, 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 I'm so obsessed with Blade Runner, I've replicated Harrison Ford's sidearm from Blade Runner three separate times, at least three times in my life. Actually, in reality, it's probably more like seven or eight, but three times where I made things that I considered finished perfect builds. Once when I was 18, once when I was 25, and then again when I was almost 40. And the one when I was 25, I had been working in special effects for a while and I had gotten some skills and I was like, oh, it's time to point these skills at a thing I want. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I spent weeks making this Blade Runner blaster. And I had a friend at the time, you know, it was like in your 20s, like a friend that you call five or six times a day, that kind of friendship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was not a very demonstrative person to a literal fault. However, at one point in the build, he said, I think what you're doing with that is cool. And just that tiny bit of encouragement meant so much to me. I knew that he loved me as my friend. I yeah. knew that we were close, but I, that really mattered. And so from that, I, I took that it was really important for me to share that information with others yeah. when I see it. Yeah. Um, and I share my knowledge, I share my techniques. There's like, I, I really try not to hold on to any of this stuff. You know, when you collect props, sometimes you end up keeping secrets, but I try not to. Um, and the other thing about that sharing is it incurs no cost. Sometimes it seems to incur a cost, especially because within corporate culture, we're, we're like inculcated with this idea that you lock down everything and no one gets in and yeah, nobody gets yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. But on a personal level, every bit that you share pays back huge dividends later on. Yeah. So in the spirit of sharing, we're about to do questions. So if people want to line up at the mics up here, we can start getting into I questions. Think there's just one here. There's just one, so yep. don't go over there. There's one over here. Good eye, good eye. Um, people can start lining up for questions. And while they're doing that, um, I, I want to talk about this transition from applying creativity as like a hobby or a side thing and then mm -hmm. making that your thing. Like, how, how can people do that? How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those decisions, when you take the thing that you're interested in and turn it into a career, they feel really scary. I mean, especially because, I mean, the things that we're interested in some, often feel like indulgences. Mm. I spent decades feeling like all my time in my shop was time stolen from my family. Mm. And I think a lot of people go through that. Um, I came around to understanding that I can have a deep consciousness about my family wherever I am in my shop, and that's not necessarily uh, related to where I am in space. It's more where I am in here. Um, but you know, the, the, I say in the introduction to every tools a hammer that the books are permission slip. Like that's my ultimate goal. When I read books by makers that I like of any stripe, uh, and for me, making is 
everything. It's coding, it's dressmaking, it's dancing, it's opera, it's welding. Um, making is any time you use your point of view to make something that didn't exist. And whenever I read a book by a maker I admire, it makes me itch to get to work. And so I hope that people feel that when they read it, but I also hope that they take this permission slip seriously because to me, my personal hobbies are so weird. I love putting on costumes of superheroes and characters from movies I like and wearing them with other people. Like, that's an indefensibly strange <laughs> hobby. And I'm not making the world a better place. I'm not solving the significant problems we have right now by doing that. But I'm also feeding something that is the engine of everything that I've achieved. Mm. And so I believe that those things we can't stop paying attention to are where we find our excellence. Mm -hmm. And I, to me, when you're going down that path and wondering whether or not this is going to be the career, it's like, if this is the thing you are obsessed with, you're going to be better at it than almost anything else. I love that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, like, I'm all about the builders. We spend a bunch of time with Alexa skills and like, getting people to make stuff. It's super, super inventive. And it's also very hard to like, get into the, I'm now gonna do this full time and I wanna make an agency and I wanna go build That transition is real, and I've had a few of those transitions in my life where I had really difficult decisions to make about where to go with my career. And I mean, those decisions were made in, in concert and in consultation with my wife and my family and you yep. know, trying to make sure I'm protecting them both in the short term and the long term. Um, it's very scary, uh, but again, like, when you're obsessed, man, every, everything that's great came about because somebody was obsessed about it. Mm. I, I mean, it, like, and Guillermo del Toro said this to me. I was like, is there any, I mean, does anyone have any better of an idea about what makes a great film? And he was like, no, but every great film has at least one champion. <laughs> I love it. Like one person who fought for it. And sometimes it's many. All right, Hello. Let's take a question. Uh, so I just recently, you know, as many people here maybe, have been in the place to start giving back a bit. And uh, for me, it's been STEM outreach. So I've been going to schools and bringing robots and exciting kids. Um, and oftentimes, I feel like the biggest challenge is that initial excitement. If you can impart just that tiny you know, spark to get them to say that you know, maybe I can do this, yeah. that really begins the whole life of, of building and creating. And uh, I would love if you have advice on how to maybe impart that or stories you have about imparting it. I'd really a, appreciate it. I like that the guy who started the questions is asking about how to start things. I, I love that. Well, and I, I, I really appreciate the ethos, too, of giving back because it's really important that we do that. Um, I would say um, always add A to STEM and STEAM because you, 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 a great idea is not an idea until you can communicate it to someone else, and that's an art. Um, you know, I learned on Mythbusters Junior that the worst thing you can say to a kid is, just say it in your own words. It's crip, especially when there's four cameras pointed at them. We realized, oh, we gotta give them some words. So we'd give them some words and they'd be like, well, that sounds weird. And I'm like, fine, just say it in a different way. Right. Um, so like, there's the way in which kids need the low cost, low threshold entry point of building something stupid of building something purposefully absurd in order to understand that this, is a, that this is genuinely a form of play, even and especially for the people at the top of their field at that discipline. Um, I would also say, when you're, if you're talking about giving back to the community, um, it's really important to recognize that, as William Gibson says, the future is here, but it's not evenly distributed. There are maker spaces in every private school in America at this point. So every white kid has access to one, but not everybody else. And it's really vital that we reach out to mar more marginalized communities and make sure that they have access to the same stuff. Because, you know, I'm, go I'm going all the way to the biggest politics now. I don't know if we'll make it out of what's going on right now, both politically and environmentally, but I do know that the only way we will is if we understand each other's experience and if a generation of digital natives gets access to the tools of creation. Thank you. Love Absolutely. It. What's that? Thank you. <laughs> hey. Hey. Um, I really appreciated uh, what you said kind of earlier in the chat, acknowledging, acknowledging uh, that voice in your head that tells you you have no business making stuff. 
because I think a lot of people kind of struggle with that negative self-narrative and don't see impressive or successful people acknowledging that they do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what has helped you quiet that narrative? Say again? What has helped you quiet that narrative when, when it speaks up that you have no business making things? What helps me quiet it? Time. Nothing else works. I mean, nothing else stops my mind from insulting me when I'm, when I'm upset with myself. Um, and I'm somebody who was born with a lot of charisma. And it's delightful. It, like it, it can be intoxicating to a fault. <laughs> my kids are very different. I have twin boys. And one of them is very much like me. So much like me that there's been times at the dinner table when he gets so loud, my wife gets mad at me. <laughs> and we, I talk openly about my spilkas, my social anxieties, because I know they're all his. And we talk about, you know, that it is nice to have charisma. Um, and again, in, 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 an industry, in every industry where leadership often depends on a great amount of charisma, it's, I'm sure, I mean, every one of us has worked with someone who has tons of charisma but no self-inspection and no ability to say that they were wrong. And nothing makes a, a worse supervisor or leader than that. So it's a long way of saying, I don't know any way to stop my internal critic or my imposter complex from showing up. I do know when it happens that if I talk about it in a quiet way with my partner and my friends, that I lessen its sting and I take away some of its power. And I also do that for somebody else. I was having dinner with a close friend, a master maker, who's been around as long as I have. This is about three years ago when I mentioned imposter complex. And he was like, what is that? <laughs> and I was like, the feeling that someone's about to walk out of a back room any moment, tap you on the shoulder and tell you it's time to go home, like relieving you from the pitcher's mound. Yeah. And he was like, that happens to you? And I'm like, dude, it happens to everyone. Yeah. And he went, I thought it was only me. <laughs> And I was like, come over here. Give me a hug, brother. Welcome to the club. Like, it's really vital we share these experiences with each other because, again, there's no future at which shit gets easier. Um, John Kabat-Zinn, one of my heroes and the man who brought mindfulness, really, to the West, of secular mindfulness to the West, says, do you want to know how your life's going to turn out? How is it? Like, that's how it's going. Um, I, all of this is germane to that voice in the head to me. Uh, and when it happened to, I mean, it happened to me on camera, untested. I was filming something and I had a really shitty day and I went home thinking you have no business building stuff and I felt really crappy. And I woke up the next morning and I didn't feel much better, but I, at least I had a plan. I knew what I had to do and I did it and I got it done. And then I thought, let me talk about this on camera. And I still get responses to that video because emotion's clearly on my face. And I, like, to me, that's a real moment of grace that I got to single out that moment and share it with my audience to tell a story about it because like, we, we all go there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, thank you so much for uh, taking the time and being here with us and sharing your thoughts and ideas and uh, inspiring us. Absolutely. Um, as a crowd that is pretty much very technical and very analytical, uh, if I may generalize. Uh, uh, you seem like a person who has somehow managed to balance this technical and creative mind. What kind of advice do you offer to us so that we can bridge this gap? Because as, as we all know, it's like both sides of the brain are pretty important. No, it's not. And that's my favorite part. Here's the thing. We, again, in our culture, we say, well, it's both an art and a science. And by doing that, we are physically placing them at either end of a, either side of a spectrum. And that's a disservice. Culturally, it's a disservice. Because, and it, like it took me to make Mythbusters to realize that what I'd read in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance 20 years before was totally true. That within the scientific method, the step form a hypothesis is a deeply creative act that comes from nothing but what's inside of us. Sure, it might seem obvious to you, but it's still internally generated. And as Piercing points out, just like anything you do, whether you draw or sculpt, 
The more you do it, the more you want to do it. The more you do it, the more it self-perpetuates. The more hypotheses you come up with for a thing, the more hypotheses show up. No matter how absurd, but it's, we all know it's a great exercise to think through every possible thing you could think of. So to me, part of the advice is to recognize that engineering is a deeply creative field. And there are as many ways to code a simple operation as there are people that you would task to do that. And that means that it is as varied as painting a painting. Um, so I, I don't make the distinction between art and science anymore. Um, like I said, there are two modes of storytelling. And uh, I think that we'd be better served to recognize that the same thing going on when I'm trying to think of a beautiful piece of engineering I came across. Oh, NASA gloves. So I was at Johnson Space Center a couple years ago and I was getting a tour around and they were like, I was obsessing about the glove. And they're like, well, let's show you the cabinet full of gloves. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, let's. And we go into this cabinet and there's like 25 years of different glove prototypes. And I'm like so like drooling and taking pictures of every single one with rulers and everything. They're like, well, maybe we should go to the other ancient cabinet of gloves. So we went to that one. It's like, whew, they blow dust off of it and undo this chain and it's even more. And these, the ways in which these engineers from days past at NASA had tried every kind of slip gimbal arrangement to keep the volume of a wrist constant as the astronaut moved their fingers around, um, it really did feel like moving through a gallery of paintings to me. Thank you. I hope that's helpful. It is. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Adam, this is um, more of an exercise in me uh, facing a few fears of standing up at a microphone and talking to someone as such as yourself in front of a crowd of well people. Well done. Have at it. Are, uh, as, good as, <laughs> as good as they are here. Uh, stop it. But uh, on, that, on that very critical topic, um, I need to know what name you settled on on your list of names on your photo here. Was it Urchins? Was it uh, Henchmen? Was it Minions? Oh, so this was an idea for a stage show that never happened. Um, I, I have built a few stage shows that I've toured around the country over the past seven or eight years. Uh, first with Jamie Heineman, and then in 2017, I did, I think, 60 cities with Michael Stevens from Vsauce. Um, and I love, I love performing on stage. I love the interaction with the audience. I love doing something, building a show that's a little bit different every night. I love that excitement. Um, I love, I love the experience of waking up on the back of a bus in a different city every morning. So this was an idea for a show that I was thinking of traveling with science kids, that it would be like, I would be sort of, I, I don't know, part of me was thinking like, what if there were more than just me on stage? Because it's a lot, to me, it seems like a lot to ask people to watch me talk for two hours. So I got to have some other stuff. Maybe I have co-hosts that are kids in lab coats and we do some absurd things on uh -huh. stage. So uh -huh. that was part of an ideation meeting about five years ago now. Um, and the thing about uh, that whiteboard is, it is, um, as many of you probably know, that is a bathroom board from Home Depot, and it's about eight bucks a sheet, as opposed to the like $350 somebody wants to charge you for the whiteboard whiteboard. The only difficulty with the board from Home Depot is that if you leave the marker on it for like a week, you gotta use rubbing alcohol to clean it off. Consequently, oh, and this is also part of the early design of this shop was that I have 24 feet of unbroken whiteboard. And I thought every now and then I'd move away all the tools and ideate for a while, and I totally haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. Hey, if this isn't too much, and after all these people, can I, get, can I come up and get a picture with you? Oh, come and get a picture now. <laughs> Hello. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm way too short for this microphone. Thank you. <laughs> um, Appreciate so you. a lot of the discussion when we talk about STEAM tends to focus on outreach toward kids, which is definitely really important. But I feel like it's also really important for us to talk about outreach to adults because they're the ones that are going to be encouraging kids to have these discussions. They're the ones that are, they have the influence on what the teaching curriculum is. They're the voters. So what can we do to better communicate STEAM and this importance in society to adults? That's a wonderful question. Um, yes, that's a big one. What was that? <laughs> um, you know, they Savage asked me if I, is coming out in a couple weeks. They asked weeks. me if I wanted to do Mythbusters again. 
And I thought about it and I said, you know, the problem is I would only want to host Mythbusters with Jamie Heineman and I don't want to host another show with Jamie Heineman. <laughs> it's nothing personal. Jamie feels exactly the same way. We just, we feel like that's a chapter. Um, but science education of people in general is a real thing. Um, I noticed as I've met some journalists in tech over the years that a lot of them don't necessarily have a solid background in tech. And I think that's actually kind of great. I love the idea. I mean, my best producer on Mythbusters visited a psychic, but she would not let a piece of, of uh, she would not let me do a piece to camera unless she understood what I meant. And that was a hell of a lesson. Um, and so I like the idea of journalists not necessarily being a super specialist in the field they're covering because it means they're gonna cover it in more layperson's terms. It also means sometimes they're gonna be more gullible and to a certain, I mean, actually, to a really specific degree, news about science in this country is abysmal. Um, I mean, you, you know, we, we don't understand how to even, the baseline of talking about what a scientific study is, you know, especially when, you, when everyone wants to get press, so they rush to get PR about it even before they've published a paper, and the paper they've published is only like a sample of six or 12, which is really regular and appalling to me that you can get a national news story for such a tiny sample size. A sample size that we used to be upset about ourselves about as having on Mythbusters, which is like universally decried as shitty methodologies. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not sure I have a specific answer to that, except that I do try and help people understand when they come to me and tell me science says things. I try and, I, I mean, I was sitting next to a guy at dinner, who's not a friend, who's like the husband of somebody who were friends of friends of mine. And somebody mentions dick pics in the room. And this guy goes, well, technically there's a study that says they actually work because blah, 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 blah. And I was like, <laughs> And I'm th I'm, I, am, I grew up with a bipolar dad. I grew up in a chaotic household. I am the reed that bends, and I really seek to avoid confrontation at any cost. But I could not let this pass. And I, but I waited until the conversation had moved on, and he was sitting next to me, and I was like, you might want to be a lot more circumspect about bringing um, uh, uh, evolutionary biology to talk about sexuality. It is a very complicated subject. And by the way, you should also know who else is stumping for those arguments you just made and see the kind of crowd you're traveling in. And here's a study that I found in the bathroom that I could show you where you could read about a more balanced way to look at this issue and to test for it. Because the study you said was, again, a bullshit study of like a sample size of six, rushed to publication and made a big splash, but wasn't actually science. I mean, that's me taking a one-man mission to help. But I mean, maybe that's incumbent on all of us to help educate the people around us for those things. I mean, because I loved, I, I, I mean, I got radicalized early by Noam Chomsky. And one of the things I love about Chomsky is he's deeply scientific in his radicalism. He says, don't take my word for the New York Times bias. Just do what I did and count the column inches they devoted to this issue versus that issue. And then you'll understand that the New York Times is a pot of boiling water and we're all frogs, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and in that, once I, once I realized that he was exhorting me as a citizen to take my own counsel and my own analysis of stuff, I started to pay attention to that level below the things that I was reading. And that first time I read a scientific study and I realized I disagreed with it for valid reasons that actually could be quantified, I felt like such an adult. It was thrilling. I don't think I've given you an actual satisfactory answer. To that. Sorry. <laughs> I think the answer was it's incumbent upon us to educate the people around us. I That's think it I is, think. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Greetings, Adam. Greetings. Uh, I was curious to know, being a public figure, um, how much do you consider, if at all, uh, the reach of your projects when you go to decide your next project? Um, I think about it a lot. Um, it actually helps tremendously. <laughs> I gave, I've given several talks at TED over the years. And the most recent one was the one that mattered the most to me. And standing there on the TED stage is super intimidating because it's like, oh, there's, there's Oprah, there's Steven Spielberg, there's Harrison Ford. Uh, it's too intense. So I reminded myself at that very minute that I'm giving a talk for these people, 
But this is only the next 20 minutes. I'm also giving a talk that will be seen, hopefully, by thousands of people uh, over time. So I really do consider that with everything that I do. I really consider the long, the long tail or, I mean, also as someone who's a public figure, I'm one hot mic away from oblivion at any given moment. I mean, because the way, <laughs> it used to really upset Jamie that the way I would relax before a piece to camera is I would tell the filthiest joke on my mind to my crew. I mean, and that's just like, that was just part of like, kind of getting into it, like, yeah, but Jamie would be like, you know that went on tape, it's like it's going onto a shelf somewhere. <laughs> Um, I do think about that, and I think about... <laughs> yeah, I, I, you can't not. You know, I'm very... I, 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 I'm sitting here in front of you, the, the beneficiary of so much privilege. Privilege to be born to the parents I was born to, to the freedom they gave me, to the support, to the, the culture that I was born into, being me and... The, when I look around and I see the luck that I've, I mean, I worked really hard to get what I have, but I've also been surpassingly lucky. And to have the luck of this platform makes it feel incumbent to me to push the values that are important to me. So with every project that I do, my values are those of encouragement and love and sharing and inclusivity and being part of, part of a culture, of being a participant in a culture rather than a consumer of it because I mean the first time a kid there is something really powerful about what they used to do in shop class for us in the 70s and the 80s because what we would do is we'd build a spice shelf for mom and when you build a spice shelf for mom and mom uses it there is like that's power that's beautiful so yeah I think about that all the time I don't know that I've come to a conclusion yet but I appreciate the question thank you thank you Um, I'm Christine from Belfast. Um, you have a Twitter message from my husband, so I apologize for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you spoke a little bit about um, being, being really good at, your, at what you do and having to learn how to hand off to other people, having to learn how to share, having to learn how to um, acknowledge that, okay, I can do this fast and my way, or they can do it their way. Can you talk a little bit about um, the process that you went through, the evolution of how you got to kind of a, a the way that you, are, you think about those things now? So, yeah, I can. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, it all depends on also the kind of creator one is. Like, there's an amazing documentary of Bruce Springsteen making the album Darkness at the Edge of Town. And if you haven't seen it, it's shocking because he and the E Street Band recorded over 60 completely separate songs and covers of different songs to end up with 12. And they recorded those 60 songs over like a two-year period pulling 14 to 16 hour days. And all of them are very open about how awful it could be. I am so not that kind of creator. Like I am, a, I joke about my skills being, being mediocre, um, but it really is true. Like I am, I am not an expert at anything that I know. And I really don't mind putting away my tools uh, at five o'clock to go home and eat dinner. Like that's, to me, a, that balanced life is, an, is a value to me. At the same time, I also don't believe in like suffering unduly to get to make something perfect. And it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna deliver what the client wants, but it means I'm gonna be realistic about what's achievable within a certain period of time. So that's the, that's the groundwork of the kind of creator I consider myself or the kind of supervisor. When you delegate, you're always giving up control. And you're giving up control as to how it gets done, you're giving control over what gets done. Um, I, and I, I got to visit Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro and I are friends, and I got to visit him on the set of Pacific Rim. And I was like being toured through a, like a 40 person art department, all doing incredible drawings of stuff. And I was like, how do you have any consistency with 40 designers across a project that's two years long. And he said, you have to give everyone complete autonomy within a tiny bandwidth. <laughs> Which is one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard about supervising people. Because when it works, when you've got someone you trust, it doesn't matter how they get it done, they're gonna bring something of theirs to it and it's gonna add value, it's gonna plus what you're doing. Um, 
but I don't necessarily yell at the people who are too slow or who get it wrong. I just move on to the person who will get it right. Uh, and those people are really hard to find. Um, I, I still have a tremendous problem delegating. If you, uh, and yet, so uh, uh, just towards the, at the end of Obama's administration, he threw a party called, just at the end of civilization, he threw a party called South by South Lawn, uh, which was like South by Southwest on the White House lawn. And um, they, they reached out to me to participate early on, and I said, I think we should have some aspirational letters, like the Hollywood sign, SXSL. And we went with that, we went forward with that. My friend, Jen Schachter, who now works for me, uh, designed these letters and their construction. And we thought, let's build these with some collaboration. So we went to the Digital Harbor Foundation in Baltimore, and they said, I said, you know, they would, gener they would bring some kids in. So I show up on, Thursday, on Friday morning before the party at the White House, which is Saturday. I show up first thing Friday morning in Baltimore, and they're like, so, can you work with 50 kids? And I was like, let's try. And we had a day that was so much fun, it was better than the next day at the White House. And the next day, I got to drive a U-Haul van on the White House lawn. It's like, not on my bucket list, but okay. Dude, it was so cool. And then, like, a Secret Service guy comes up, and he's like, you have seven minutes to empty your truck, assemble your thing, and get out of here. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to take you totally seriously. What are you going to do, shoot me? Uh-huh. Well, now. Yeah. Um, it's a process. I'm still learning it. I've had several shop assistants in my time. I have one now who works for me full-time. She just, Jen Schechter, who designed those letters, is a real powerhouse. Uh, and is one of those people, and I've met a few of them, like the moment I met her, I knew that I could teach her anything and that she's actually better than me in a lot, at a ton of stuff, which is fabulous. So I really look forward to seeing what that collaboration is like, because I haven't had a full-time assistant uh, of that level before. And I'm really curious as to what that's going to bring out of the shop. Um, again, every one of these answers is more like a commiserative <laughs> story, but it, it is, it's an ongoing process. Well, Thank you. And so Thank with that, we're going into high speed round. Okay. We've got a few minutes. We can get through all okay, these questions, we have eight but we're going to go rapid people. We can fire. Do this. Yep. Hello. So from my own experience, I found a lot of value in kind of explicitly looking for things I thought were impossible or at least probably not within my own uh, level of expertise and then trying to accomplish it no matter what, despite that. Are there any projects or builds you've gone into that you thought were impossible or also even given this environment of the conference, is there anything that you think is still not quite possible given the current state of technology and expertise oh. that we have? Yeah, I don't think we're gonna have, I don't think we're gonna have super intelligent AI for another 100 years, like where you're conversing with it like it's a person. I definitely think there'll be AI that can fool you into you thinking it's a person. I'm not sure the Turing test is the right threshold. I can't wait for autonomous cars. I can't wait to give up driving. I, I'm so happy my kids will not have to take my car keys from me when I'm 80 and still think I'm okay to drive. Um, that's a really in interesting question. Uh, I think it's gonna, I, I go back and forth. I mean, I feel like it's gonna take longer to go to space than everyone thinks, and yet we're making inroads way faster than I thought, but I'm not sure if the timeline is a limiting factor anymore. Uh, you know. I, uh, the thing that worries me about the future is that we still have a lot to talk about in terms of privacy in order to have a world that actually works. And we don't have a, a great cultural approach to privacy yet. Uh, the news over the past 18 months has been a lot better. I mean, the, the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal with Facebook, it was a great wake-up call for folks. Um, and privacy intersects with copyright in really important ways that are also dangerous. I love the North Bergen, New Jersey high school kids making a production of Alien with garbage and enthusiasm. And when they got a call from Ridley Scott, the teacher at that school thought he was about to lose his career because that's how afraid we are about copyright. This is surpassingly obvious fair use, and yet it's so hard for people to know that. Um, you asked a technical question, and I went right to politics. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's, that, 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 that's cover some of it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm going to think more about that, though. Thanks. 
Uh, what's a tool or something you purchased recently under $100 that had a really positive impact on your life? Ooh, what a good question. Um, hmm. Oh, mm, wait, wait. This is, okay, I'm going to answer the next question while thinking about this one. I want to get this one right. Hold on, I'm just also going to... This, because it kind of galvanizes my brain, my whole brain is in my photo folder of my phone. Um, so if I do uh, albums, albums, there we go. And I look at this and I think, you know, a tool or an item? Under $100. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, that, yeah. that's the tough one. <laughs> because Milwaukee just released a battery powered rivet gun which is really sweet. Um, it's not as fast as my pneumatic rivet gun, but it's about the same price, but it's like about 200 bucks. Okay, go ahead, what's your question? Yeah, so you started out by talking about how you drive projects, and you said that it's a lot about checklists and obsession. I can really relate to that, but then you also manage that you have a, to have a great work-life balance, and you can go home at five, and you can feel contempt about having dinner with your family. How do you balance the obsession and the family in a good way? That's the trickiest problem. I mean, and every partner I've ever had has felt that I spent too much time in the shop until now. And I've learned the hard way that I could be, so to me, it's about a consciousness. Like when I'm present with my family, I don't have to actually be in the same room, it turns out. Uh, I have been more present with my family in a shop that was 30 minutes from my house than I have been with the shop that was in the basement of my house. Uh, so. Uh, in the early days of Mythbusters, it was intoxicating. I was coming home every single day with like, I hand fed an octopus that fell in love with me today and there's hickeys all the way up to my shoulder. <laughs> I flew in a Blue Angels jet and threw up and it didn't diminish from my experience. And so I'd come home every day with stories and my wife was like, I love that you love your job, but slow down just a little bit, cowboy. Like, ho the house is happening while you're not here. And you're a participant in that, not the main event at six o'clock when you come in the door. Yeah. That's such a wonderful perspective. And so my wife asked me, you know, think about, think on your way home from work, think about what's it like in my house right now? I wonder how the day went in my house. I wonder how my kids are. I wonder what's been going on. I wonder how the dogs are. And that consciousness put me so much more into a frame of being present that it helped shed, it helped me shed that feeling that all my time in the shop was spent stealing time from my family. That somehow I thought that it was so pleasurable for me to be at the workbench that it felt like I was cheating. And I really now realize the degree to which that is part of the, like, the food that I need to eat in order to live. Um, it's, an, you know, every partnership is hard. Every partnership requires a whole bunch of balance. And I think one of the other things my wife said to me that gave me great perspective was, it just didn't feel at that, and this was part of a separate issue, but it's sort of germane to the same thing. She said, I just don't feel like you've got my back in this situation. And I was like, right, that is a feeling. And that's a value to me that you should feel like I have your back. We are partners, we have each other's back. Uh, and it, those perspectives really help me understand that balance that the shop is this really important spiritual, mental, emotional practice for me. Thank you for that. Oh. Okay, one Sorry. minute, 36 seconds. What tool? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if there's a recent... Oh, yeah, there's this beautiful... And I, I'm going to have to tweet about the name because it's a maker who sent it to me a young man who was inspired by the one day builds we were doing on Tested to design his own um, mat knife blade holder. The mat knife blades are the trapezoidal blades, they're called carpet cutters, and the standard holder, which uses a flat head screw, is just the, one of the shittiest holders there is for anything. You've got to undo this thing, the knife dulls immediately, it's awful, and they make ones that are faster, but they're all terrible. Like, I've yet to meet one I think is great. But this kid designed one that uses laser cut steel and these clever ways that the blade pops out with just the touch of a finger, pops back in, switches around, and it slides into a holder that is hard to get it out of until you're holding it in the right way and then snick, it pops out. 
but it won't go back in until your finger's in the right place. So I will promise I'll tweet about this tomorrow back in my shop. Uh, that's the latest tool that's made my life better. Awesome. So to wrap up, I'd love to get your take on what are you taking away from, from Remars? What's your, what's your takeaway so far? <laughs> I really hope they send me up in the Orion capsule. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I want to be a civilian ambassador to space. I'll bring my own spacesuit. Um, I, you, one of the most surprising things about, again, I said at the beginning of Mythbusters, I was, I was thinking of science as something that smart people did. And it was only when the show started to become popular and we started to work with scientists and engineers who were experts and they showed up and they immediately treated Jamie and I as peers because they understood that the mindset was the primary thing. The training is secondary. And that peerage is one of the most rewarding aspects of doing the job because it, it gave me confidence in myself as an engineer, as a scientist. It made me understand that I can be part of that continuum of helping to educate, helping, us all, helping ourselves as a culture to understand how the world works. Uh, and when I come to a place, a place like this and I experience that peerage again, but also that enthusiasm, like I, there's a thing that happens to me a lot where I'll meet a fan and they'll ask me some questions and then they'll ask, I'll ask them some questions and whatever they do, they think is dumb. They're like, ah, I make wooden clogs for a, you know, a historic restoration company. And I'm all like, shit, you got to tell me all about this. <laughs> I'm excited about what anyone might be making. And yeah. when people share that excitement, again, it's places in which new things get tripped in the back of our minds as maybe this is something I have a place to contribute. And one of the other aspects of making Mythbusters that was great was researching material until I realized I had a point of view. And here, it, this is the kind of place I come to have my point of view changed and challenged and widened. And nothing could be better for the world, in my opinion. Awesome. Well, thanks for doing that for me. Absolutely. And, and for coming today. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you guys you so much. much. Thank you very much. Thanks for such great questions. <laughs>